Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm not Sebastian Rosado, and neither are you. Uh, uh, if the uh, the plague wasn't enough, my colleague Professor Rosado, who uh, normally would be hosting these seminars, uh, would be uh, up here. But a uh, uh, a problem with uh, the electricity um, at Casa Rosado uh, has. Uh, uh, cut him off from uh, all communication. There is some possibility, I'm reliably informed, uh, that the uh, electrical problem may be resolved uh, by the Q&A uh, the Q &A session, in which case he will grab back the baton out of my old and feeble hand uh, and reassert his uh, control over the session. Um, <clears throat> it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all uh, to the uh, last of the uh, spring 2020 uh, Notre Dame International Security Center uh, seminars. Uh, and we've saved the best for last. Uh, Dr. Madison Schramm uh, is uh, NDIS postdoctoral fellow. She's uh, been with us uh, here uh, for this year, although she's coming to us today um, from Pittsburgh, PA. Uh, Maddie uh, finished her uh, PhD at Georgetown University. University claims to be also a Catholic university, but uh, none of us have uh, ever seen um, any uh, evidence of that. Um, I could go on um, and on uh, uh, singing her praises about all the interesting things she's done, including uh, having served as a, uh, uh, a Hillary uh, Rodham Clinton Research Fellow um, at Georgetown um, and having a uh, forthcoming uh, security studies uh, article. But I think uh, in the interest of uh, getting to her very interesting paper, uh, I will turn it over to Matt. Addy, uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Mike, uh, for that kind of, very kind introduction. And uh, to Anika and Sebastian for setting up the logistics, especially virtually, I know um, this was not an easy lift. Um, and I hope everyone um, who's listening out there is uh, staying well and taking care. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking about a piece of a larger project that I've been working on, exploring democratic foreign policy decision-making and threat perception. Um, so I am going to attempt to share my screen. Let's see if this works. Good? Okay. So over the past 75 years or so, uh, US foreign policy has been dominated by threats from charismatic authoritarian leaders. And we can think of Mao, Stalin, Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, uh, just to name a few. And so what is it about these adversaries that makes them so threatening and their challenges seem so uncom uh, uncompromising or all-consuming? So IR theory provides an answer that these regimes have weak institutional constraints and therefore are unable to make credible commitments. But this explanation can't account for why democracies, and certain democracies in particular, seem to find these strong men to be particularly acute threats. And so I argue, first, that the threat posed by the institutional characteristics of an adversary state is mediated by cognitive biases. So following a long literature in political psychology, strong enemy images tend to augment threat by providing a focal point, something that's more evocative than abstract discussions of states, populations, or geostrategic concerns. Secondly, democratic leaders will respond differently to these tangible enemy images. So despite the renaissance in political psychology we've witnessed in the past five or 10 years, IR scholars haven't paid that much attention to cultural psychology. And research from cultural psychology indicates that cultural or social identity actually affects the salience of supposed universal biases. So in particular, uh, individuals emphasis on focal points, 
uh, we should expect these to vary across states and therefore exert different effects on threat perception. So strong enemy images won't have the same effects on threat between states. And so to investigate this, I conducted five survey experiments with proxies for foreign policy elites in the US, UK, Brazil, and India between 2016 and 2019. And the surveys were designed to investigate how first the institutional characteristics of an adversary state affected threat, how the image of the adversary affected threat, and then how these results varied between different settings. So from the US and UK, I found that strong enemy images do play a substantial role in increasing respondent threat, and that independently, institutional characteristics of an adversary state weren't sufficient to increase threat. However, the surveys I conducted in Indian Brazil produced null findings, indicating that the susceptibility of leaders to these biases, particularly attribution and vividness, won't be consistent in different settings. And so before I dive in further, why should we care about this, right? First for US foreign policy. So if threat perception is substantially affected by images, we would expect decision makers and states to overreact to adversaries that include strong enemy images, while potentially underreacting to those that, that lack such a focal point. And this could result in potentially unnecessary interventions on the one hand and distraction from more pressing threats. And secondly, IR literature. So if leaders are affected by adversary images and information distinctly, it calls into question purely institutionalist or rationalist accounts of regime type and conflict. And lastly, methodologically. So research in IR tends to suffer from a Eurocentric bias and the literature in political psychology is no different. However, the findings presented here problematize studies that purport universal biases or constructions of threat without providing evidence in multiple settings. So I'm gonna um, provide an overview of the theory, discuss the methodology a bit, and present the results from the survey experiments, and can conclude with a uh, discussion in future research. So I'm going to start with the theory on cognitive biases. So the vividness effect, which has been studied in economics, psychology, and political science, indicates that individuals weigh information that is perceived as more tangible more heavily. And when this tangible information is tied to an individual opponent, it can facilitate the attribution bias or a tendency to interpret behavior in terms of internal dispositional factors as opposed to external environmental constraints. And these interrelated biases have two effects. So first, a tendency to blame strongman opponents and secondly, to weigh their actions more heavily. And cumulatively, we should expect this to produce an increase in democratic leaders' threat perception when presented with strong enemy images. This leads me to my first hypothesis. Strong enemy images will augment threat. However, political psychology research on the aforementioned biases tends to emphasize evidence exclusively from the US and Western European democracies. But scholarship in cultural psychology has consistently found that individual susceptibility to the vividness effect and attribution, the two aforementioned biases, will manifest differently across groups. Cognition is conditioned by identity, our social and cultural identity. And as many have noted, presuming findings conducted in one setting will travel cross-nationally is at the very least problematic. And this is because cognitive processes are intertwined with culturally specific contexts and meanings. And we should therefore expect some variation in the effects of these universal biases. And so most relevant here are the manifestations again of the two biases I discussed earlier, attribution and vividness. And in one experiment in cultural psychology, researchers found that Chinese students were more inclined to explain homicides with regard to the situation or contextual characteristics, while their American counterparts tended to focus on the disposition of the murderer. In another, researchers found Chinese and Japanese respondents have a better memory for contextual details, while Americans more so for central objects. And if these psychological processes are affected by individuals' interpretations of their experiences, 
and if they reflect in part culturally based meanings and practices, it follows that culture represents a source of patterning for psychological functioning. So if threat perception regarding rivals is affected by culture, biases that predispose a focus on an individual opponent might not function the same way in different contexts. And this leads me to my second hypothesis. Democratic leaders will respond differently to tangible enemy images. And so to test this, I conducted five survey experiments with proxies for foreign policy elites in the US, UK, India, and Brazil. And the survey experiments are a particularly useful tool for this because they allow you to disentangle different factors that may account for support or opposition to particular policies or decisions. And they allow for the construction of alternative scenarios in which the features of the situation themselves and the characteristics of the actors involved are directly manipulated. And so the surveys were designed to explore how the image of a rival autocrat and structure of that rival autocrat's regime affect democratic threat perception across states. And so respondents at each site read a fictional vignette set 10 years in the future and kind of structured like a New York Times article that described an attack on a strategic partner. Um, the survey description before the vignette in the US, for example, read, in the next 10 years, Tajikistan will become a partner in the US war on terror. American military bases around Dushanbe will become the focal point for air operations in Central Asia and Tajikistan will house radars that form a critical part of America's missile defense system. So the description of the attack itself includes the adversary country's troops advancing across the border into the ally, killing a number of ally country civilians, and foreign policy decision makers in the respondent country, the home country, fear that these adversaries' actions could destabilize the ally country. And so respondents were then asked to gauge the threat posed to their national security interests. And there were four versions of the survey that varied along these two axes. So the first is the structure of the opponent regime, and the other is the vividness of the adversary. And so in the two vividness, forms, high and low, the high vividness versions included an image of the adversary uh, and the country's fictional president and repeated his name four times. The low vividness version included an image of an, uh, an assembly hall and referred to the actions taken in terms of the state. Um, and just to give you an example, here you see the high, one of the high vividness versions, and you can see in the, the title for the article, the image and then several uh, in several places underline the repetition of the leader's name. Alternatively, the low vividness version here has just the state's name in, in the, the title for the article and repeats the state, the state itself several times throughout and is accompanied by a picture of an assembly hall. So the other axes that I mentioned is the regime structure version. So one is personalist, sort of accounting for the strongman question, um, and the other is not personalist. So in the personalist versions of the survey, uh, included a fictional professor or expert that varied between countries um, based on institutions of prestige that described the adversary's political structure as a personalist um, in the personalist version or not personalist. Um, and the language here was uh, adapted slightly from Barbara Geddes Branton Wright's work in 2014. And here you can see the example. And I apologize to any um, real Professor Bell at, at Harvard University out there. Um, but you can see that the language described here in the personalist version, the president personally controls the instruments of state such that the military and all security agencies, as opposed to in the non-personalist version, the regime is fairly institutionalized and both the military and party bureaucrats hold enormous sway over defense policy, functionally giving them the personalist and non-personalist version. And this is actually the only information that they receive in the vignettes, or they receive in the forms um, regarding the actual institutional structure of the regime. And so this again produced these four versions. Uh, low vividness, not personalist, what I use is kind of the baseline category, low vividness personalist, high vividness personalist, and high vividness not personalist. And the surveys were conducted in Washington, D.C., um, online via Mechanical Turk, 
um, in Birmingham, UK, and in Delhi and Pune in India, uh, and Sao Paulo, Brazil, with um, the generous support of um, Endesk, actually. Um, and there were approximately 2,100 respondents between the different sites. Um, and the surveys were conducted between the fall of 2016 and the fall of 2019. So I conducted um, all of these surveys um, myself in person, uh, with the exception of uh, the survey in India, where I worked very closely with an ARI on the ground. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about the, the logistics of this, but um, we proctored the surveys in person and they were timed. So to minimize communication between the respondents and to ensure they didn't look up information, although this was sort of a fictional scenario set in the future. Versions were kept as similar as possible, although between the different sites, there were uh, slight uh, um, alterations that were needed. So for example, because we were trying to hone in on sort of um, um, on how they responded to threat, the, the um, being very careful with language was paramount. So we changed everything to English spellings when we did this in, in the UK, um, as well as in India. And then in Brazil, I worked with several native speakers um, on a translation, some of whom um, uh, work in this field, so have a, a technical understanding of the language, um, to make sure that what the respondents were looking at um, they wouldn't be distracted by perhaps issues with regard to language or translation. And so the analysis um, I use includes summary statistics, uh, uh, regression analysis, and marginal effects. Um, I'm going to present the summary statistics and focus the analysis on respondents who passed the manipulation check, um, which I'm happy to talk more about um, if there are any questions. So starting with the analysis from Georgetown, so this is uh, just the summary statistics. Um, and it presents the forms by the percent of respondents that identified the threats taken um, to be, uh, the actions taken, I apologize, to be a threat to national security. And as you can see here, the high vividness personalist version is substantially higher than the other four versions, particularly higher than the baseline low vividness, not per personalist. Um, and in the case of Georgetown, uh, the number of respondents was 322. This just gives us a snapshot though of the initial numbers. But moving into the regression and control and which allows us also to control for all the other demographic information that was collected in the surveys to make sure that this isn't accounting for any of these differences we're seeing. We see again, and I apologize that the order is slightly different in the first column, high vividness personalist um, again is appears to be um, the highest and the results from the survey uh, indicate that respondents that perceived threats more acutely when the vividness of the adversary was high and when the regime structure was described as personalist or the high vividness personalist form. And neither regime structure nor the adversary image were independently sufficient to increase threat. Only collectively or, or uh, together were they. Um, this was statistically significant in all models, um, the high vividness personalist version differing from the baseline. And the substantive interpretation of this is about, is that about uh, respondents who received this form, high vividness personalist, were about 40% more likely to perceive the actions taken as a threat. And so moving on to the Mechanical Turk um, analysis. So this you can see had um, a higher number of respondents at 893 and was conducted in the summer of 2017. Um, here again, high vivid personalist in purple uh, seems to be the highest of the four forms at 84% while the baseline um, is, uh, is about 82. Um, and in the next form, we'll, uh, I'll, in the next page, I'll show how this is actually a significant difference between these two. And that's one of the benefits of using Mechanical Turk, a larger, larger sample size. And so the results from the surveys at Mechanical Turk kind of echo those from Georgetown. Uh, respondents perceived threats more acutely when the vividness of the leader was high and the regime was described as personalist, neither of these things being sufficient independently to increase respondent threat. Um, this was statistically significant in all the models. And, like it, um, and while at Georgetown, we saw this increased threat about 40%, here it was closer to 10% from the baseline. So moving on to the results from the UK survey. 
Um, so you can see here, high vividness personalist still is, um, still had the highest percentage of folks um, identifying the actions taken as a threat. Um, but you also might notice that the number of respondents here is substantially smaller than those at other sites. Um, but again, high vividness personalist does seem to be, does seem to be the, the highest uh, form uh, where folks identified the actions taken as a threat. Moving on to the analysis, um, we see that respondents perceive threats more acutely again here when the adversary of the leader, uh, the adversary leader was high vividness and the regime was described as personalist. Um, and individually, again, these didn't produce any results. Um, the substantive interpretation here is that uh, those who received the high vividness personalist form were approximately 50% more likely to identify the actions taken as a threat than had they received the baseline. Um, you may notice here that the low vividness personalist version dropped out of the analysis. Um, and this is uh, because so many folks, uh, because so few folks um, who received this version passed the manipulation check. Um, so there's no variation. Uh, so it's excluded from the regression analysis. Um, this is not tremendously surprising because of the, the small n we, I encountered in the UK. Okay, so moving on to India. So in India, the surveys were conducted this past fall. Um, we managed to gather about 360 respondents. And you can see that actually the baseline here, low vividness, not personalist, had the highest percentage of folks identify the actions taken as a threat. Um, but, and, and high vividness personalist, although second to that, doesn't come close, let alone exceed it. Um, and this may indicate the relationship between attribution, vividness, and threat are distinct from the US and the UK. But we need to look at the regression analysis. So moving to the regression analysis, we find that India produced no statistical or substantive results, um, indicating again that the, sus the susceptibility of respondents to vividness and primes for attribution and the relationship to threat may vary between states. Okay, and lastly, we're gonna move on to the analysis in Brazil. So these are the summary statistics from Brazil. And here again, you can see there seems to be very little difference between the forms with uh, low vividness personalists, interestingly, um, um, seeming smaller than the others. But high vividness personalist, where it had showed up um, consistently in the US and the UK, um, does not um, seem to be a more threatening form here. But the, and the analysis kind of confirms that. Um, like India, it produced no statistical or substantive results. And again, it indicates that the susceptibility of respondents to vividness um, and primes for attribution are likely working differently between states. Um, and I wanted to make two quick additional points on Brazil that I found interesting. So first is in the US and UK, um, approximately 40% of folks passed the manipulation check or uh, assigned blame for the actions to the adversary. Um, and in Brazil, about 20% did so. So a much smaller, um, much smaller percentage, um, which, which first indicates that they, they are less susceptible, susceptible to the prime, and then also that it doesn't necessarily have the same relationship to threat. And then secondly, in a number of respondents in Brazil actually attributed fault for the attack to the ally country. And I hadn't, hadn't thought about this before running the surveys, but the way the surveys are set up, you might have noticed um, in, in the, the brief discussion that they're justified as um, because of continued violations of airspace. And my thinking is that the blame for the ally country might actually be, um, be a byproduct of different weight assigned to violations of sovereignty. So they see that as more egregious than necessarily what I thought the adversary response to that would be. So to summarize the results from the five surveys, and I apologize, I've thrown a lot at you in just a little bit of time. Um, the survey experiments conducted in the US and the UK indicate that when respondents received the high vividness personalist version, they were between 10 and 50% more likely to consider the actions taken of the adversary a threat to national security. Independently, institutional arrangement was insufficient to increase respondent threat. And these results provide support that vividness or tangibility do play an important role 
and increasing threat perception, and that institutional arrangement alone is insufficient to explain increased democratic personal conflict in some cases. In Brazil and India, respondents did not identify any version as consistently more threatening. And this demonstrates that the relationship between vividness, attribution, and, and threat varies between states. And so this work is engaging with folks like Barbara Geddes, Richard Herman, Mike Horowitz, uh, Rose McDermott, Jonathan Mercer, and others, and challenging purely institutional rationalist accounts of regime type and conflict. And it also points to the important role in, of cognitive biases in the construction of threat. And it indicates that the salience of these biases will vary um, between countries. And on sort of the methodological and theoretical contribution, um, some of the lessons from this are that scholars should perhaps be wary of theories built on universal psychological arguments or theories of threat construction that fail to provide substantial evidence in different settings. Um, expanding the site and substance of survey work is really critical to the external validity of theories across more diverse contexts. This research also, uh, I think, provides additional evidence that the discipline should support more publications of uh, null results, as these are important sites for comparison and investigation in and of themselves. And uh, just a quick note on uh, lines of future research um, and something I've been thinking about and interested in, in, in uh, pursuing, pursuing next, um, is future research should examine sort of inverting this question. So how are abstract threats conceptualized and challenged and, and interpreted? So if the research presented today is correct and the US and UK and certain countries are more predisposed to perceive threats from strong enemy, strong images or focal points, but this isn't necessarily true cross-nationally, what does this mean when we're facing a particularly abstract threat that lacks the kind of focal point? So cybersecurity, the climate emergency, health pandemics, you know, how, how do we perceive those threats and how do we react to them? And how does this vary between, between states? Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, great, uh, thank you very much, Maddie. Um, we'll now turn to the uh, question and answer uh, session of uh, our event today. Um, if you want to go to the uh, NDISC website, we have uh, helpful virtual meeting tips. Um, but I, I'm going to give you the, uh, the uh, top line results of the uh, helpful virtual meeting tips. Um, uh, you should go to uh, manage participants. Um, and when you're there, uh, you can click to uh, raise your hand. Um, and I will see your hand and recognize you uh, in roughly the uh, order in which you've uh, raised your hand. Of course, attentive uh, members of the NDISC uh, community uh, know that there's a uh, end run option that's available, which is uh, uh, in vivo, uh, the two finger option. Uh, but again, using the uh, managed participants option, if you have a question uh, that is so on topic and so burning, uh, that uh, you should jump the queue, uh, then replace uh, the raised hand uh, with uh, the raised thumb, which is under the three dot uh, more option uh, on your manage uh, participants. Um, and uh, so the uh, betting window is uh, open uh, for uh, questions. Uh, I see Sebastian Rosado is back up on the net. Um, and so after recognizing uh, Dan Lindley, uh, I will turn the comm over uh, to him and uh, his capable hands. Uh, so uh, Dan, um, and please uh, put your camera on and uh, 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 I'll uh, unmute you uh, when the time comes. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, thank you for a great talk, Maddie. That was fun. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I think 
you mentioned that you're being very careful about language and you kind of specified that was in the context of spelling in the UK way. But I think if I heard you right, part of your language was using the term war on terror. Mm -hmm. uh, is that correct? Because I would think that's a very loaded term, uh, perhaps culturally significant. It certainly carries a lot of baggage in our country. It's both a standard term that we don't really question, but it's also a loaded term. Uh, I don't know if you know it carries, and I wonder if you have some remarks on the portability of the words war on terror uh, to other cultures. Uh, and um, the second thing, I'm wondering if you have some more intuition on what it is about personalist leaders that gets people riled up. And you can sort of think, uh, the easy answer would be it's, you know, Kim Jong-un or something like that. You think crazy nutball, right? Mm -hmm. now, some personalist leaders are reasonable, nice people, uh, Martin Luther King or, you know, whoever it might be. But I would think some of the time they would tend to be uh, more prone to Looney Tunes compared to a constitutionally balanced checks and balances, three, you know, different mm -hmm. parts of government, that kind of thing. So if you can just expand on the intuition or what you think is going on with personalism, as well as the language war on terror, I'd appreciate hearing about it. Absolutely, and thank you, that's a great question. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the vignettes were slightly different in, at each site, and um, in the read ahead, in the appendix, I apologize, this was a bit buried, um, I gave the description for each scenario. So the war on terror frame was used specifically for the US, and part of this was that it was, uh, at the time in 2016, I think a good fit for discussing our, um, a potential uh, sort of deepening in the relationship with US and Tajikistan. Um, but for uh, the British and for others, that was, that was not the frame. Um, I used counterterrorism operations um, in, in the British context. Um, in, uh, and then in India, um, it was framed as access to energy resources and Air Force operations in the region. And I mentioned ca uh, counterterrorism, um, but it, it, I didn't use the same language, war on terror, in, um, in other, um, other, um, other contexts. Um, it would, but that's, a, that's a, an excellent question. And sort of to that point, this is, this is where slight modifications were made. I was trying to choose um, cases that I think f folks, based on survey work, don't know a tremendous about Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, and in Brazil, Suriname and Guyana, um, but that were plausible for deepening military and political relationships. Um, but so you had these, these slight, slight differences in the setup for each, but the language and the treatments remained um, almost identical. And the second question is, is um, something I grapple with every day. <laughs> um, and, uh, so I think, I think one, um, I tend to focus uh, from, on this question from the perspective of the, the U.S. and other Western European democracies that seem to um, be particularly inclined to find these, these states as threatening. And I think there are a variety of reasons for this. I think one is um, certain social narratives that, that sort of, sort of reified um, these adversaries as, as, again, representing sort of the anathema of democracy. Um, I think some of it has to do, um, uh, some of it also has to do with how we conceptualize just the moral fluidity or character of, of, of life in the U.S. and particular countries. And this is one thing that literature and cultural psychology, there's not a lot of agreement on why they find these differences. Um, but I think in the U.S. at least, there, there is more of an emphasis than in some of the other places I'm talking about on the individual, on the individual as an agent, culturally and socially, um, that may facilitate these type of biases. Thank you. If that answers your question. <laughs> uh, I'm back, Maddie, I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, I now know why uh, militaries hit the electric system at the beginning of a war, uh, because life is pretty much impossible without it. Um, anyway, uh, let's move along here. Uh, Eugene, hang on, there we go. All right, I've been unmuted by the host and I'm starting video because Mike said I need video. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, hey, Maddie, nice to Hi. see you. I'm, uh, you know, sorry this whole coronavirus thing has gotten in the way of seeing you more often. Yes. But welcome back to Endisk. <laughs> um, 
so I, I want to ask you two things. The first one is a, a little bit of an easy question and a cheap shot, but I kind of want you to um, uh, say more about it for the audience of people here who may not be steeped in survey experiments and um, uh, accessible samples. Mm. So, um, you know, you've made some claims about democratic leaders' beliefs based mm. on survey experiments of Georgetown and Birmingham University students and some people who spend a lot of time sitting on the internet clicking things for tiny amounts of money <laughs> on MTurk. And I'm not actually sure exactly who your samples were in India and, and, and uh, Brazil, but I bet they're also surveys of convenience um, uh, because you said you sat with them for a long time. So um, talk about how survey experiment mm -hmm. methods work or don't work uh, and about, you know, what you might learn from these things. That's just a softball, but it's a poke. Um, now, the, the, the real question, um, I, I'd love it if you would talk some about alternative explanations mm -hmm. for the difference you found between the US and the UK and Brazil and India. And um, you attribute it to, hey, culture is different, cultural psychology is different, um, people don't react to stimulus the same way. That seems possible, but I'll float one, um, mm -hmm. which is the US and the UK are countries with long histories of projecting power and pretending to care about strategic interests elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And Brazil and India are stay-at-home kind of countries. Um, they sometimes have sort of real security threats, but sometimes not. Mm -hmm. They kind of talk in this language, but you asked a bunch of Brazilians and Indians about um, what they viewed as a threat to an ally in a trivial country. Mm -hmm. And most of them said, yes, there's a threat. And if they didn't, you kicked him out of the data set. But they said, yes, there's a threat because you told them Mm -hmm. that this is an important place and there's a threat here. Mm -hmm. um, and they parroted that back to you. But I'm wondering if what's really going on here is that you're measuring the survey respondents' disbelief in your scenario. So in Brazil and India, you told them this is a threat. And a bunch of people said, you've got to be joking. This has nothing to do with India or Brazil or whatever. And they're just out. And the others are like, okay, whatever you say. And they, they said yes. Mm -hmm. But the vividness doesn't have any effect on that because the only thing that they're doing is parroting back this completely unbelievable statement that you told them to parrot back. Um, and uh, so that's just one. That's the one that strikes me because there's a huge difference between the security environments of the U.S. and the U.K. or the security stories of the mm -hmm. U.S. and the U.K. and Brazil and India, but maybe there are others. Mm -hmm. um, and so attributing this to cultural psychology strikes me as a leap. Thank you. Those are both great questions. Definitely the second one is tough. Um, so I'm going to start with the first. <laughs> um, and I take your point, and it's, I think it's a really important one that um, the survey samples that we use are generally not the folks we're talking about. So these were not um, high-level decision makers in each country. Um, but I would also push back on saying that these were samples of convenience. At Georgetown, of course, I was a PhD student when I was conducting them there, which um, allowed, me to, um, allowed me to survey the students. But I was interested in surveying students in democracies at the top programs that produce the most policymakers. So in India, that's JNU, and in uh, Brazil, that's FGV. Um, and that's not to say that, again, you're going to see a perfect similarity between um, decision making by folks in their second or third year of a political science program and uh, actual policymakers. But we do know that these institutions have produced quite a few of those folks domestically. Um, and actually, I would argue these folks are a bad proxy for public opinion more broadly. 
because economically, socially, they aren't representative of folks in the country at large. What they are a better measure of is capturing the demographics and I would say to a certain extent, the sort of socialization that we would expect in, in these places, Georgetown included in that. Um, MTurk, yes, um, absolutely. There are some problems, but I think the, the a lot of literature has found that you know it, it is they have been able to replicate um, work that has been done on MTurk. Although I think my concerns are slightly different, so it tends to be actually um, a highly educated audience. Um, it tends to be folks who are doing survey research, who are doctoral students sitting at home. Uh, clicking, clicking through things and either figuring out how to put together their own surveys, I know in part because I did this myself, um, or looking at what other folks are doing. Um, and so they actually tend to have more knowledge based on uh, uh, my work with this and reading of. I was able to limit the IP address, first of all, to folks in the US. I included an additional attention check and they were timed because I wasn't able to um, supervise in person, of course. Um, and then within all of these, I didn't mention this earlier, I included a question of would you, be able, would you be willing or interested in working for the government in the future? And again, this will hopefully capturing a little bit more of kind of what I'm looking for. Um, and I found that did not change results. But I do take your point that this is absolutely not a perfect sample. There are a lot of issues with it. Um, but I would argue that for what I, the questions I'm asking, this is um, an appropriate sample, although not, not ideal. Um, and the second question, which I think is, is really important. So thinking about, and as I mentioned before, the scenarios differed um, between each case. And in each case, I, I worked to, with folks oftentimes from, from the country in question to sort of develop a scenario that was not as far-fetched. Um, so, so the one in Georgetown and MTurk, I mentioned, but um, at Birmingham, uh, it was Tajikistan became a critical partner for NATO and OSCE counter operations. The majority of terrorist attacks against London and Paris emanate out of this region at this time. Uh, NATO bases around Dushanbe become focal points, da 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 da. Um, and so it's more about the, the, inner, the, the sort of collective security response, um, but thinking about it as a threat, particularly as this was being conducted close to, um, close to London. Um, and part of this is trying to ward against both floor and ceiling effects, because if the scenario is so unbelievable and ridiculous, we'd expect everyone to have kind of this, this null. Um, but at the same time, if I choose something that's a very obvious threat, or I know, so for example, if I'd used the example of Pakistan with regard to India, I would have expected some ceiling effects. So trying to ward against that by finding something that's plausible and potentially finding a connection of interest. Um, but yes, I think that's a fair question. If, uh, if, if I might have been producing sort of floor ceiling effect, I would floor effects in India and um, India and Brazil. And it's, it is possible that that is the case. Um, but I wouldn't have expected any variation um, were that to be true. But I, I take your point. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mike Desch. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Maddie. Uh, great presentation and uh, great paper. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, uh, the null findings in the uh, Brazilian, um, the uh, UK, um, and uh, India surveys. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you your, your data makes the case that uh, people in those countries, and I'm assuming the MTurk respondents, uh, are mostly, if not all, Americans. Can you tell that? So I, uh, yeah, so I, I did control for citizenship, and they had to have an IP address in the US. So, it, it, yes. <laughs> okay, so I, I, you know, I think your uh, argument that, uh, you know, people outside the United States respond uh, differently than uh, than Americans do, um, you know, has uh, some support for it. I, I'm wondering, though, uh, given that none of the alternative uh, combinations of adversary image and adversary regime uh, were uh, significant, um, what you might have missed. 
um, and mm -hmm. what the uh, significance of the insignificance uh, mm -hmm. of those other things, uh, you know, could mean. Um, is it, you know, the case that, uh, you know, there's no combinations of uh, uh, image and regime that would have resonated outside the, uh, the American mm -hmm. context? Uh, or, you know, is it a reflection of something along the lines uh, of what Eugene was saying, that the, uh, you know, the, the, the framework didn't uh, compute at all? And do you anticipate uh, when you uh, start running this through the gauntlet of uh, peer review uh, mm -hmm. that you'll have to answer that question? Yeah, that's a great question, Mike. Thank you. Um, so to start with, um, you know, why, what, what sort of the insignificant me insignificance means. Um, and so when I started doing this, I think my expectation or let's say hope to sort of, you know, produce something uh, really, really uh, exciting is that institutions wouldn't have any effect. Um, but one of the things I take from this is that obviously institutions do matter and we do weigh information from institutions, but that's not going to do it alone, in part because these, are all, these things are often tied together. So I was functionally trying to disentangle, right, the effects of vividness on the one hand and structure on the other, when they always go together. But I do think that one of the things this points to is that independently, so just having information, and this is, you know, things that uh, Karen Yar Amelia has pointed to and others, you know, is not weighed the same way. That being said, just kind of images without any sort of informational background, especially when we expect the folks who are making these decisions um, to be, you know, ed well educated and, you know, conversant in foreign policy, it also aren't going to increase threat, that you really have to have both working together. Um, so that's one of the reasons I thought that these other versions other than high vividness, not personalist, um, didn't reach uh, significance with regard to the baseline. Um, and then in, in, with regard to the, those conducted in Brazil and India, I do think um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good point. It could have been floor effects. Um, I did work with folks in India and Brazil to sort of mold this to be a very plausible scenario. Um, so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that is what's going on. Um, but I do think that's absolutely something I'll have to address in, um, in the review process and to account for um, why I don't think, uh, why I think that this was actually um, a, a good question that I would expect to produce, have enough room to produce variation. So again, not the floor effect and not the ceiling effect, but actually um, produce some variation. Um, so I'll have to work on, I think, making that case in the paper. Are there, just to follow up very quickly, um, are there other axes that, you know, maybe upon reflection, um, you know, uh, might have gotten, uh, you know, more significant results, uh, you know, beyond adversary image or adversary regime? Could there be other characteristics of, uh, you know, of states that uh, uh, would, uh, or of leaders that, you know, would have, um, you know, uh, crystallized uh, by culture, or by state, which is ultimately, I think, the, you know, the core of what you're mm -hmm. uh, trying to demonstrate. Absolutely. I think one that I, 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 I structured the, 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 the surveys very carefully to try to account for in some way is, is of course, race. And there have been folks who've done really good survey work on this, indicating that um, particularly folks in the U.S. and Western Europe uh, support for different campaigns or threat associated with um, leaders who appear to be from the Middle East or Africa um, is going to be higher than otherwise. Um, so I attempted to control for that, but that is another important access. Um, that I think would, would, would garner some more um, analytic purchase. And I also think I mentioned in Brazil, it, it struck me so much that uh, so many folks attributed blame for the attack to the ally country. Um, but when reading it, because it's set up as a violation of airspace, because our U US bases are, uh, in this case, Brazil's the Brazilian military is cooperating, um, 
it, it didn't strike me that they might weigh sovereignty and those violations of their airspace is so much more substantial that when a conflict broke out, they actually would attribute fault to the ally in that scenario. Um, so I think also thinking, thinking about these different, um, I've, I've learned a lot and I think there's quite a bit I would do differently, but those are just a few things. Thank you very much. Um, Fritz Heinzen. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. No, very good, very good. Um, I, I, I found a paper in, in, in this discussion um, in, in many ways, I, I, I can agree with much of what's being put forward. Um, and, and especially, there are differences obviously between um, elites who, who you were interviewing in, in the four different countries. But I'm wondering if there's more than just sort of a cultural or more than a, an individualist or a collectivist society, these, all these different types of things. And is it possible that there's more a historical dimension to this and that the U.S. Um, let, let's take a look at, at the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, the major adversaries for over 100 years have been Hitler, Mussolini, uh, Tojo, uh, in the Cold War, Stalin, Mao. So, so the enemies have happened to be very personal monsters standing out uh, amongst um, evil men. These were, uh, you know, incredibly evil. Whereas, and I was, I, I, I was thinking when I was reading your paper and I, and I was thinking as you were talking, or I was trying to think of Brazil's opponents mm -hmm. and India's opponents. And I, I was trying to put names to opponents. And Musharraf in Pakistan or something like that, but, but they didn't engage in a, in, in a major war against him or something. So you, you can see where I'm headed with this, Absolutely. is how much is the historical dimension uh, a, a part to this whole notion of who's an enemy? And how do you personal, or how do you look at an enemy and personalize an enemy? That's a, thank you, that's a fantastic question. And a, another um, paper, I'm working on, and these are all sort of pieces of uh, my dissertation that I'm trying to cobble together into a book, um, looks at more sort of the, the social and the socio-historical components, particularly within the US and Western Europe that lend itself to this. And so there's a huge historical component. I, um, I don't address it in this paper, but I absolutely agree with what you're saying. So how the sort of post-world post uh, world order and the post-war narrative has been constructed and understood in the U.S. and Western Europe is, is really punctuated by exactly what you said, these strongman leaders. And that's huge in terms of cultivating our identity. So I also think right, th these questions of social identity and, and history aren't independent. They're very much constitutive. Um, but absolutely, I, I completely agree that history is playing um, a huge role here. Well, if you don't mind, then I'd, I'd like to ask where, okay, what, what is the broadest framework of your, of your work? And how, how, many, how many chapters in this dissertation? This is, what you presented is one chapter out of how many? And trying to get sort of the scope of, I'm trying to get a sense of the scope of your work and where this chapter fits into the, into the scope of your work. Okay. Um, so it's, it's pretty uh, standard five, five, six, five chapter dissertation. Okay. Um, so in, in, in what's now an article um, version, I have sort of a theory talking about, um, again, these sort of socialization and his, historical processes that um, lend themselves to um, leaders in the US being more predisposed to identifying these charismatic leaders, um, opponents as threats, um, and sort of theory. And then I do these series of ex uh, survey experiments. I test this statistically. Never, uh, using a variety of conflict data sets. And I did two um, case studies um, looking at both the US and the UK perspective on the Gulf, um, the first Gulf War and the Suez crisis of 56 um, to sort of examine how they conceptualized Gamal Abdel Nasser and then Saddam Hussein. Okay, um, and then uh, uh, one more quick question and then I'll sort of shut up and let uh, everybody else ask. But did you think to approach let's say the Council on Foreign Relations or an organization like that, which has folks who have been engaged in, in foreign policy and national security, uh, 
and, and, and in the UK, um, what, what, uh, IISS and things like that. Did you think about approaching some of those where there are more practitioners as opposed to students? Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> I, am, I am very much, I have been trying, I've been on a lobbying campaign for since I started doing these to try to um, get folks to allow me to use their platform or um, to, to support additional survey experiments. Um, understandably, and I, I know I used to work at CFR, they're, they're very protective of their, their membership base and um, not, not very willing to send out, <laughs> send out my um, an underlings emails. But um, I, I have talked to folks at TRIP previously and mm -hmm. am uh, hoping to follow up with them soon about the possibility of embedding this in one of their surveys, which I think would also give uh, a better. Um, very good. Yeah, but thank you. That's a great comment. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time and I, I appreciate your work. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, Moritz Greifrath. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Uh, hi, Maddie. Thank you very much for, your, for presenting this work. I'm always uh, eager to learn more about different sides of your, your big research agenda, so that was really appreciated. Um, I have two questions, and I think they're both rather, rather theoretical. Um, one uh, about your theory in particular, and one about sort of the entire uh, psychological renaissance, as you, as you call it, uh, a more general, and I was uh, wondering what your takes were on, on these two points. Um, so first, um, it seems like uh, what, you, what you're doing is you're telling us that the, very complica the complication of theory that introduced biases, right, added to this other variable that's hard to grasp and that's really adding another dimension to our theorizing, doesn't make it complicated enough. We have to complicate it even further by now having an interaction uh, between certain biases and the cultural background. And we're, so we are we're trying to making everything more complicated. And the question for me always is when we make our theories more complicated, how much do we really gain? Uh, what, what degree of the variation do we capture now that we weren't previously able to capture? And I know you talked about this when you described your, your survey um, results, but I was wondering if you could sort of um, um, tell us a little bit more maybe about some, some interesting or, or important cases that you think you can really add something to. I know you touched upon this a little bit, but some, some uh, further justification for that would be great. Um, even people like Karen Yarhi Milo, right, she, she introduces biases, which already scares people because it's very, very complicated. Um, and she has a pretty hard time justifying what, what do we gain uh, compared to sort of standard rational models that look only at capabilities and threat perception or something like that. Um, and relatedly, at what point do we stop, right? Shouldn't we also include another variation where we not only look at the interaction between biases and culture, but also between personal history, et cetera, et cetera. So my question is basically, where do you justify the stop or the, the degree of complexity that you're, you're arriving at here? Um, and, and relatedly, in more general, the big point is, to what degree do you think this whole psychological renaissance is able to, to produce something like a cumulative theory or a body of theory, um, rather than just sort of a, a long list um, of findings that show, oh, look, this bias seems to matter and this bias seems to matter, but we really don't have any idea in sort of how all these different um, findings speak to each other, right? Is there any way for us to sort of take this all together and form a coherent body of theory out of it? Or is it simply, look, in general, we find these, body, these, uh, these biases and these biases, and that's where we leave it at. Um, thank you very much. So I'm going to start uh, with your first question of, you know, so what, what can this tell us or what is this, you know, really shedding um, light on? So First, I would say, so given the, the literature that I, I mentioned in cultural psychology, I didn't test my findings in East Asia, so in China or in Russia, but based on them, I would expect that their threat construct construction and how they respond to vivid threats will likely be different than we do in the US. So if we're thinking about, you know, bilateral relations, the possibility for conflict, how we perceive Putin is very different than he might perceive Trump. And similarly with Xi. And these are important considerations. Similarly, when we're thinking of, like I mentioned, more abstract threats, if other countries are more adept at dealing with abstract threats or responding to them, that's a serious concern for the US and also for our competitors. If we're thinking about how we're gonna deal with the climate emergency, again, global health pandemics, cybersecurity, to the extent that they need to be better adept to respond to these threats, I would think that would be something that we would be concerned about. Um, and then secondly, with regard to sort of parsimony versus complexity. Um, so I guess I would, I would push back and say, you know, parsimony is great in, in theory, but how much can it actually tell us? 
And so I understand that introducing cultural biases is another complication, but if it actually offers some insights into other countries and not just the US, and having an understanding of how we think of threat in the US and how Western Europe thinks about threat is important and useful, but it's also important that we understand other countries' construction of threat, because otherwise we're not going to be very good at bargaining, at engaging in conflict. Um, so it's not sufficient that we make models that speak to our own experience. Um, I think we need to broaden the scope quite a bit. Um, and then third, with regard to whether, you know, this uh, psychological renaissance isn't my word, it's the word that was used in uh, the Hafner et al, a special edition of IO um, a couple months ago. And, you know, for that, I, I do absolutely think that there is a really impressive body of work that is being produced um, that points to findings on how Americans and how leaders, when they're more likely to support, to support action, what signals they're likely to interpret. And I think, I mean, going back to Jervis, I do, uh, Jervis, uh, George, Shal you know, I do think there's a quite a big body of work here. Um, and I do think it's complicated, but I, 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 I don't, I, I would push back on that idea that it hasn't push, put together a sort of a really rich body of work. No, I, if, I, if I'm goofing around this, so just to restate the question, I think the last one didn't really come across uh, uh, correctly, maybe. I mean, what my, what my question was is, um, so there's, you're absolutely right, there's this huge body of work, and much of it is very well done, uh, and they find different kinds of biases, right? So you have vividness, and you have uh, folks that find that whether people did study abroad or not matters, and people find that um, other parts of personal history matter, and all culture matters, and all these things matter, right? Um, mm -hmm. But in any given situation, that leaves me very much, it, it, it's sort of the, the cumulative effect of all of this is that I'm sitting there and then I should go through all these biases and try to find out what all of them together tell me, right? So it, what I'm saying is I have a hard time seeing this become one coherent um, and applicable uh, theoretical alternative in general, rather than just sort of a body of work that works within the same tradition, but there's really no way for me uh, as an outsider um, to uh, put it all together into one coherent body. Uh, Maddie, just before you answer, let, let me just restate what Marat said in my own words. I'm not trying to take words out of his mouth, but um, and, and and this is not this is not about your paper per se, because as you know, I wasn't there for the, <laughs> for the talk. Uh, but this is about the biases literature. The, mm -hmm. the point is that if you proliferate biases, mm -hmm. uh, you get to the point where um, you can you can describe why someone did something so you say so and so acted this way or so and so has this attitude because they exhibit seven different biases mm -hmm. but in doing that you're moving away from explanation you're moving towards just description you're just saying this person has these features and yeah these features led them to make this decision um but you, you're not explaining you're not providing sort of the the, the driving force uh, explanation for why certain things are done and so we're moving away from I guess hate to say it but theory and political science to sort of more narrative historical accounts so I, I, I would push back on that I disagree so I think this research actually can account not just for uh, events historically but also predict how our leaders will react to particular threats Right, so this is, this is useful insofar as it is to a certain extent predictive. And based on you know, the research I presented here, but also the other, the other uh, research that is being done, and again, the political psychology research is very broad. It doesn't, it's, not, it's not just sort of uh, research focused on biases. But if we have an understanding and can test systematically through surveys, through narrative, through automated content analysis, discourse analysis, et cetera, that certain associations are likely or that certain certain biases tend to produce particular responses, be them um, action, kinetic or emotional, then this will give us insight to future events. So in this case, I would expect, right, leaders in the US and the UK to respond more aggressively to a Putin or to a Xi than to a country that has more of a collective form of government. And even the case of China is interesting because you're seeing the sort of increasing consolidation of power and him being highlighted individually. Um, but I do think that has some analytic purchase and predictive value. Uh, Moritz, you, you good? Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Manny, for your, for your taking the time. 
Uh, in which case, we'll go to uh, Jeremy Graham. All right. Thanks, Sebastian. And thank you, Maddie. Uh, this okay. is, uh, I always like getting to learn about something like, you know, survey experiments, which I, you know, don't know much about. So I found the paper was really educational. Uh, and uh, I think you, know, you, you took a really clever strategy, I think, to operationalize uh, vividness and uh, personalism. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is about the survey vignette. So I understand that um, the threat is against an ally country, right? So this is the mm -hmm. surveys are set 10 years in the future and there's a uh, troops uh, of the adversary country advance across the border into the ally. Um, mm -hmm. Why set it up with the ally as opposed to like a, a home, uh, an invasion of the homeland? Um, you know, I, and, and yeah. there's just a couple reasons, you know, and I'm, and I'm sure you have your reasons because it's so uh, blatantly done, but, you know, I wonder, you know, you know, uh, uh, springing off of uh, Gene's point is that maybe the reason that you get a different view in the U.S. and the U.K. versus Brazil and India is because, you know, you have, you know, sort of two sets of countries with, you know, with different involvement in alliances or different, you know, participation in, uh, you know, global politics. And, you know, one sees, you know, a dominoes, you know, falling and, you know, cascading around, uh, you know, so it just seems like a, an unnecessary complication, particularly, you know, with, you know, when you have countries whose democratic credentials themselves uh, may be in question. And so mm -hmm. that just seems like you're adding this, uh, uh, you know, an odd filtration. Uh, but but I'm just curious as to, you know, like how you came up with that. Um, and just the second point, uh, I thought maybe you could help explain your marginal effects plots. Because um, mm -hmm. I, I think I think that they just need for your reader as you shop this around yes. uh, a little bit more. So I'm looking at figure two. And, um, uh, and I'm looking at the high visibility personalist and I see that the point estimate uh, at the top of the rectangle is something like 0.77. I believe that was the number you gave in your presentation. So that slender vertical line though, mm -hmm. is that like a confidence interval yes. where, okay, so, so does that mean then if we look at just the, the next column over the high visibility, the high visi uh, vivid uh, non-personalist that there's, it looks like there's some likelihood that the high vis personalist and the high vid non-personalist actually have, you know, maybe have the same marginal effect because the confidence intervals uh, overlap. Um, am, I, am I understanding uh, that, that that's the case, that maybe they have the same marginal effect? So I looked at them, so I didn't compare internally, but comparing to the baseline, um, the only one to reach significance, and you can, if you go down to the, um, or right above that rather, um, to the uh, table one with the, the kind of full data output of the regression analysis, you can see here that the high vividness personalist is the only one to reach significance. So those, you're correct, those are the, the, the sort of the error terms associated with. Um, and the other two don't substantially or differ enough. And you can kind of see this looking at the error bar. It does, right, right. You're, you're right, it does look like they might overlap though. I see what you're yeah. saying. Um, but no, uh, high vividness personalist is the only one that is uh, statistically distinct. Yeah, and just as a follow up with that, I'd be really interested, uh, you know, and maybe something worth reporting uh, for your null findings, what mm -hmm. the p value is on those. Because mm. if you have, a, you know, if the p value is something like 0.11 or 0.12, then the p values across the set of countries are actually not that different. Because just looking at the regression table, I only saw uh, one uh, where you had a p-value less than 0 0.05, right? Because the oh, table yes. one is, is 0 0.1. So, so, but if the probability value is very different uh, across the groups, then that would be something that, uh, you yeah. know, uh, your readers would probably be interested to know. Great, thank you. And sorry, just to return to your, to your first question, and, and it's an important one. Um, and this is something that um, I think I spend almost as long uh, putting together the surveys um, that as I did actually fielding them. And one of the reasons is trying to find this middle ground of countries that we wouldn't expect folks to have too many priors regarding countries that, but I could still create sort of a plausible um, scenario. Um, and so that was, and then also one that avoided either 
where I would expect respondents to have either a really high level of threat or just couldn't care less, right? And so with the question of, you know, why not just have it be an invasion of their own country, with that I would expect such a spike um, in, in threat that I might not be able to capture much variation between the different mm -hmm. forms. Um, but no, that's a great question. Okay, thanks. Great, uh, Ilana Rothkopf. Oh, hang on, I'm sorry, I missed the button. Hang on, I don't think I unmuted you. Uh, lost Ilana, hang on. Oh, she's just, oh no, there she is. <laughs> uh, but thank you, Maddie, for this oh, sure. paper. I enjoyed reading it. Um, I just have one, I guess, I have a small comment, which, which is that, um, I thought maybe it would be helpful to you to talk about what the proxies for leadership are like right at the beginning, because on mm -hmm. that first page, it almost sounds like you're it, you're going to be saying that you were interviewing or not interviewing, surveying um, policymakers or mm -hmm. government decision makers. Which um, I know you're not, because you're saying it's that you're interviewing prox uh, interviewing sorry, surveying proxies, um, surveying students. Um, but really, like you have the survey respondents that you have and. Yeah. I think you can really lean into this idea that you mentioned much later, sort of in passing and in the footnote on the paper, in a, the paper, that these students are basically being trained to be the future policy makers and policy leaders that I knew a lot of George Hunter School of Foreign Service undergraduates who can't wait to, you know, join government service. Um, but really lean into that at the beginning and sort of frame it, so it around this idea that like, yes, I'm not interviewing leaders, but I'm interviewing like the leaders of tomorrow. Um, like that. <laughs> yeah, or surveying. Um, and then the question, a question I had is that you have this um, control of government work. Is that just the, the one you mentioned in one of the footnotes, which is they're asked whether they imagine working for the government in the future, or is that something else? So it is, it's, um, would you be interested in working uh, with a government in the future? Um, and I found, so it, it, this obviously varies between states, but uh, being able to use it as a control and then also uh, just looking at those responses might get a, give a better picture. Um, I had to frame it very carefully and I'm still concerned that in some cases uh, it may have been interpreted as, would you work for, the, I, I tried to make it clear, the government sort of abstractly in the future, mm -hmm. um, but they may have interpreted, you know, I don't wanna work for this government because of whatever their political um, affiliation was at the time, um, but yes. <laughs> so they're not primed at the beginning to, you know, imagine that you're working in the civil service or something like that, they're, they, for them, it's just a public opinion survey. Exactly, so, okay. uh, right, so the student, students were the, um, uh, the, the surveys themselves were randomized and literally toting <laughs> bags full of surveys handed out in hard copy um, and the demographic information or the demographic questionnaire came after. Um, so the only thing they read prior to the vignette was uh, the informed consent and then that little, that little piece um, I mentioned before. So kind of describing what the world will look like in 10 years with regard to this bilateral relation. Um, and then they did have, uh, in part because asking about political affiliation or government work up front could potentially um, bias things in, in, in given directions. Okay, and then my other, it's like very small comment is that I wonder if, and that it would be useful to, um, you know, instead of introducing, you know, this is the US survey and then a little disc so your discussion of the results and then the Brazil's are uh, not in that order, but to yeah. have like one of those those figures where you have like a pat each like a patch but like, yeah like each marginal effects pot in a panel so someone can mm. look at them all at once and then sort of yeah. describe the findings more in in relation to one another rather than describing each survey experiment one at a time and I at least for me I feel like as a reader it would make it easier for me to keep track of what's going on and how everything compares but no. thank you no absolutely that's really helpful and I think you're totally right the way it's uh, written now and also presented is uh, dry is a kind word <laughs> to use. So yeah, I think you're right. I think sort of bundling perhaps the U.S. and the U.K. and then the other uh, India and Brazil would um, and focus on the, the the comparison between the two would would read better as well. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, as far as I know, that means we've reached the end of the list, but I'll just wait uh, in case uh, the hands up, people haven't figured out how to use the hands up icon. Uh, we're getting pretty close to the end of the session anyway. Uh, not seeing anything, uh, I'll just say, Maddie, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you as our NDISC postdoc this year. Uh, this was a fitting end uh, to that time. I'm just sorry that couldn't be in person. Uh, you can't hear anybody else clapping, uh, so <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a clap. <laughs> and, oh, no, I, I, see, I see some virtual clap. Um, but uh, thank you, and uh, it, it's been a real pleasure. Thank oh, hang on, know. hang on. Oh, no, those are claps, not hands up. The icon. <laughs> <laughs> now everybody's clapping. It looks like I have a list of 30 people. But uh, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully we can, uh, we can do this in person sometime. Yes. Thank you so much. This has been incredibly helpful. Wonderful.